We're good. Good morning. Welcome to the operations committee. I want to welcome everybody here in in house and also uh, anyone who's listening in the community. And I would like to get started right away with the agenda. And on the agenda this morning is the budget development update. How about that? Thank you. Good morning, Courtney Desabay from the Chief Financial Officer's Office. Courtney Desabay, Special Assistant to the Chief Financial Officer. So this morning's um, budget process update is going to start with where we are in the process currently. So um, as of March 27th, all the budget tools were um, closed and the queues were approved. Um, all items were moved forward for reconciliation. You guys not hearing me properly? something do you have a PowerPoint connected to this and it's, mm -hmm. this is what I'm yeah. looking at okay 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 thank you check check all right so, I'm um, sorry, my name is Courtney Desabay. I'm the Special Assistant to the Chief Financial Officer. Uh, so, I'll begin the uh, update with the budget process update where we are currently. So, all the budget tools are currently closed and the approval queues are completed. This was as of March 27th. Um, Human Capital has been working on the position reconciliation, so they're taking all the information from the various budget tools, reconciling it with the people movement that needs to be done in the district for the final budget. Uh, the finance team is working on verifying all the cost strings uh, of the, from the budget and from the various um, budget tools. Uh, communications is working on the budget book format and the narratives as well as the final presentation. Um, once HC finishes reconciliation, which uh, should for the most part be done by today, um, finance will do the reconciliation of the budget with the um, funding model. So make sure that all the revenue and all the um, expenses match from the budget tools and to the revenue model. Yeah. And the board presentation, as you well know, will be next week, Tuesday, um, April 24th. So next up, um, at our last public meeting, we had a discussion on the community engagements. Uh, the day after that meeting, on the 14th, we put up on the website um, a list of community engagements that we worked on with some of our community partners. So we just wanted to share those dates and locations. Um, the first would be Wednesday, April 25th at the Bentaloo Recreation Center. We have Thursday, April 26th at the Y in Waverly. We have Monday, April 30th at Highland Town Elementary Middle School. That's the only one of these that's at a school location. Um, Tuesday, May 1st, which we had already scheduled is here in the central office, the board forum. Wednesday, May 2nd is at Liberty Recreation Center, and Thursday, May 3rd, Arundel Elementary Middle. Sorry. Um, so as you can see, these are spread out around the district, so they pretty much cover all the regions around the city. Um, the goal was to be able to touch as many different areas of the city as possible. Any questions on those? Yeah, I do have questions. Sure. Um, and I'm looking at it. It's still, I think, is it a good, we had this discussion about it being spread out all as many yes. places as possible to make it possible for the, the community to have an input in it. Correct. Um, but there are some areas, um, there's some serious areas, well, the Arundel is in Cherry Hill, right? Yes, yes. Right. Okay, what about, is one place that I, I see is missing that some of the community people were here last time, that was in Edmondson Village. I don't see that. That's a distance away from, from all of these other areas. Uh, is it that far? Did you measure? Um, I'm not sure what the distance is. I can discuss it with the FCE team. I know they chose the locations based on the community partnerships and relationships, um, being able to reach out to community partners that have people attend the meetings and so forth. I think some of the community, the stakeholders, community people were saying that they didn't have the opportunity uh, to be a part of it. And, and one of the areas I thought was Edmondson Village, which like Edmondson West Side in that area, that's quite a distance away from where um, the 
teachers or community to get to somebody's means you, you know some of them have to catch buses so I know that the um, both um, Dr. St. Lisa's is a special assistant, Christy Lewis, as well as the um, who used to work in engagement as well as the community engagement office, really worked with our community partners to identify places that they thought um, had better representation across the city. So this is the list that they came up with um, based on kind of the feedback from those conversations with community partners. Okay, good. Thank you. Just out of curiosity. So people, the community will not say that we didn't, we weren't aggressive as to making sure uh -huh. that they were a part of it. Mm -hmm. Could you just ask if it was possible that, or did they check into that area? Okay. That's quite a large area that we would like to make sure we don't miss. Okay. Okay. You know? I, I can follow up with and the FCT. They have an active community mm -hmm. so a group up there. Mm -hmm. And we just want to make sure okay. that mm -hmm. they get that. I mean, I'm so happy that you see Anne Arundel. Excuse me, a rundle, not a uh -huh. rundle. Uh -huh. I'm glad that because that was one of the issues too. I mean, they they're in distance away. Right. Like I mean, I think they were trying to get the basic quadrants of the city. So you've got the southeast, you've got the Cherry Hill area, you've got you know what you've got kind of like southwest. the various quadrants. Of the south southwest. Mm -hmm. Southwest. Yeah, I hear you. Is, I'm, I mean. I mean, I'm not sure yeah, the when they mapped them out, it, it really formed almost a perfect circle around the yeah. city. It covered you uh -huh. know, all the areas okay, around the city. Just for me knowing the area, I'm just saying, could you just check? Yeah. Sure, because absolutely. Because Southwest, that's a mm -hmm. big area, Edmondson Avenue, mm -hmm. Edmondson Village. That is a huge mm -hmm. area, just just so that we won't miss anything. Yeah, and if we can do okay, that. okay, then mm -hmm. I'm happy. But I just want to yep. make sure we did cover that area. But we thank will. you very mm -hmm. much. Okay. The meetings, the regional community budget meetings, are these a continuation of meetings that you've had, that we've had already, or, or are these, I know they're new meetings, but are they in addition to meetings that we've already had around the city with the same subject matter? No, the, the subject matter here will be tailored to us, uh, it'll be very similar to the presentation that we make to the board on April 24th on the presentation on the FY19 budget. So this is not something that we've been sharing yet with the community. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Courtney, may I? Is this an opportunity for community to give input on what they think the budget should be, or is it a presentation simply on what the budget is? So you said 19, and I just want to make sure that I'm clear on managing expectations of community members when they're there. Right. So it's a presentation on on the budget for FY19, the proposed budget to the board. It gives the community an opportunity to give their input and feedback on what is presented, or and more so for the board to be able to hear the community's feedback and input on what's presented before they vote on the 8th, or before you vote on the 8th. Yeah. I understand that for the board forum. I meant for the yeah. other meetings out and about. Just that format, you. I think, would be similar for the other meetings as well, yes. Perfect. Thank you. All right. All right, next we have the, uh, the development calendar. So where we are right now is um, inching closely towards the, the budget presentation on April 24th. The reconciliation portion of um, the budget development process is just about completed, as I mentioned earlier. So the team's are working very hard right now putting together the, the preliminary budget book as well as the presentation and the presentations for these community meetings. Um, reconciling all the numbers on all the information is really quite a lot of information to, to make match and to make sure the numbers are, are correct. So the team's working very diligently on that. Everyone, not just finance, we have human capital, IT, uh, communications. So that's where we are in the process right now. Um, next upcoming items, we have those community meetings. We have the presentation, the preliminary budget book. We have the board forum, which you mentioned earlier, and we have the vote on May 8th, final budget book being posted online May 8th and printed. And we have to submit the final budget to City Council on May 9th, really the day after the vote. Any questions on the remaining timeline? Okay. Thank That's you it. very much. Thank you. Any, you have any questions for us? No. Uh, I do not. <laughs> okay, thanks a lot. Okay. Okay, next, please, 21st Century Schools update. Thank you.
morning, um, uh, Chief of Staff and Board Members. Um, we're going to do a brief presentation on the school openings. My name is Nicole Price, Director of Community and Public Relations for 21st Century School Buildings Program. Good morning. I'm Sherry Vinson, the interim executive director for the program. I'm Maureen Gershberg, uh, facilities planner. So as you all know, um, on April the 4th, we opened um, our second set of 21st century school buildings, Dorothea Height in Lyndhurst uh, Elementary Middle School. Um, we did have a ribbon cutting for Dorothea Height just before the school opened on March the 17th. Um, that both of those, the opening as well as the ribbon cutting, received lots of positive um, press, lots of positive um, social media um, comments, uh, both on Twitter, Facebook, as well as in Instagram. Um, we were we did stories with um, Channel 13, Channel 2, as well as um, WYPR um, radio for the ribbon cutting between the ribbon cutting at Dorothea Height and um, opening of first day. The um, one of the comments uh, I think we have all been trying to capture in in a quick soundbite what this actually means. Um, one of the principals said, uh, "We always tell our children how much we love them, and this building speaks that." Um, we all we, we a lot of the team members felt like that that really communicated what the building saying what this project is about without having to say a word. The building actually communicates the investment that we're making in students. Again, uh, we got lots of positive press. Dorothy I. Height um, had a big fanfare for their students as they came back. Those are the pictures on the right with the red carpet, the balloons, um, and then students um, got right back to academics um, and started the day. All of the classrooms, uh, actually at both schools, started with some type of restorative practice circle talking about the building and what it means and what it meant to them. Um, and you can also see students um, even on the first day using collaborative space, which we talk a lot about in the new buildings program. Just to give you a brief uh, overview of what we have coming up uh, in May and June of this year, feasibility studies will be finishing up for the Plan Year 2 schools. Um, these will include Patterson High School, which of course will be a revised EAP. Um, it will be a revised budget to capture the remediation efforts that came out of an environmental study that the district had performed uh, for the site. And so these are just additional uh, measures that the district has chosen to take um, as precautionary measures. Uh, so that will come through. Uh, the revision will be to look at the increased budget only. Uh, and then we will have James Mosier Elementary School, which will now be a PK to 2 that has had a grade band reconfiguration um, in conjunction with Calverton, which has already uh, moved through the board. Um, Calverton will be the th uh, grades 3 to 8. And we'll also have Commodore John Rogers Elementary Middle School and Highland Town 237 Elementary Middle School. Those two I mentioned together because they um, will be addition only that you will see um, to relieve the overcrowding in those two buildings. So um, each will receive a new wing that will allow us to move the um, middle school out of the base building. And then Robert Coleman Elementary School, uh, which will um, be an addition only uh, for that school. Northwood Elementary School has not been determined at this point in time whether it will be uh, a renovation addition or a replacement. And then Montebello Elementary Middle School, which will be uh, a renovation. So. And then upcoming uh, school openings for the fall of this year uh, will include Pimlico Elementary Middle School, um, Forest Park High School, Robert Poole Building, the ACE and Independence programs, and that is also at high school level, at least ACE, is that it correct? Yeah. Middle High. Yes, yeah, sorry. And then Arundel uh, Elementary School uh, and Cherry Hill Elementary Middle, those two again similar to um, James Mosher and um, Calverton have undergone uh, grade band reconfigurations. 
And then we are going to now present um, one, one quick oh, note sorry. on uh, Rundle. You all will probably be seeing a request to change the school program and building name in the um, sometime next month. I appreciate it. Um, so, um, and um, the, I just want to clarify, and Robert Coleman, you just said it was an addition only, but that's a little different than the Highland Town. And oh, I apologize. I, you know what? I misspoke. Robert yeah. Coleman, I apologize. Yes, I was thinking about something completely different. Yes. Um, wrong school. There's just yeah. too many. Uh, Robert Coleman will be um, a renovation with a very small, uh, perhaps, addition, but that is a fairly tight site. Um, it was a, an open floor plan school, and we will be um, relaying out the interior uh, classrooms to allow all the classrooms to have natural light around the perimeter. Yeah. Um, so it'll be a, a nice renovation for the school, but that will not be, um, that will not include a, any large additions, and it will not be a replacement. Sorry, thank you. Yep, I just want to make sure. Yep. Uh, let's see. Is that up? There it is. I'll let you hold on to that. I'm just going to do a brief introduction. Thank you, Nicole. So we are going to present uh, cross country um, elementary middle school to you today. This the um, feasibility study that is before you. Um, is a little bit unique. Uh, Maureen will uh, explain in greater detail, uh, but there uh, was an agreement that had been made about uh, 10 years ago um, that actually precluded our ability to, uh, to increase the footprint of this school capacity. and the capacity, so either one, basically. The, capacity. the capacity of the school, sorry, I'll be more specific. Um, so uh, you'll see that this will be a. Is there a problem? Okay. Okay. Sorry. Um, this will be a, uh, a highly strategic renovation, uh, which and then one small addition uh, was possible to um, address the gym itself and uh, the layout, the circulation at the rear of the building. So, Maureen. Good morning. <laughs> Um, you'll see the <coughs> proposed plan for cross country elementary middle up here, and it's pretty much the exact same thing as what they have now, as Sherry explained. We're not going to be really touching the building um, in terms of any major additions. Uh, the agreement that was made in the 90s was um, they did not want to expand the capacity of the school. So when we are working with the architects, telling them it was going to be a renovation only with very few strategic moves inside, they suggested that we could perhaps at a minimum right size the gym, which is very tiny right now. Um, sorry, it's distorted up there, but it's normal up there. <laughs> um, so the scheme we came up with, it's going to, if you look at where the dotted line is, it's going to be expanding the gym and it's the demolition is going to be three classrooms in the back, so we're putting back three classrooms. But that's the extent of the addition. Uh, the current gym is probably half the size, like about where the dotted line is right there. Yeah. So again, this is going to be a renovation only, so new, um, new finishes, 21st century IT, those kinds of upgrades. But the classrooms are pretty much staying exactly where they are. Um, there is, I think, two or three minor um, interventions that we suggested to the architect, uh, like an office suite that we're going to be like recapturing, and then a computer lab that we're going to be recapturing for office space, a couple of those types of things, but again, very, very minimal. This is, pretty, this is a renovation only project. Could I interrupt with a quick question? Yeah. Um, in, in looking at both this and the next few pictures, is there anything going to be done to clearly identify a front entrance? to say this is signage, this is, this is where you come in this building. Um. With Cross Country, um, it, the, the main entrance is on Cross Country Boulevard. Um, there is signage there. We will probably enhance that signage. Um, we weren't contemplating doing uh, more than cleaning the brick facade and then uh, if you, 
I guess I, there are walkways and that lead to the front door. You feel that it's, it's just under underserved in, um, in that. I, I, I honestly haven't been past this building since I started thinking about this. But uh -huh. in going to many of our buildings, we want to be opening. We want to be welcoming to the community. We want to have a positive presence, but so often it's really challenging to find where the front door is. Yes. Robert Coleman or is exactly what the name, like that. You, yes. you should yes. be exactly. able to drive by a building yes. and go, oh, that's an elementary school right. as you're looking at property and saying, should I buy my house here? And it just seems when I look at the pictures, especially in the next couple renderings of, of the building exterior, you don't go, oh, there's the door. This, this says welcome in. Um, the door. So okay. right here is the main entrance. So I think we could go back and look at that. Sometimes there's some minor treatment that we can make that has a big impact. That would be um, wonderful. So we definitely can keep that on the radar screen. I agree. Yeah. And then I think with signage, we usually do I try to do a good job of making it right. more clear, too. But I agree that most of our existing schools, it's totally unclear what the entrance is. The signage does not pop. I personally know I spend a lot of yeah. time walking around the exterior <laughs> buildings trying to figure out which is the entrance that and works. And we so. want to be there. So if we're looking at yes. engagement strategies, yes. helping, helping people say, oh, this is a welcoming, yeah. loving school. Absolutely. Would be great. Thank you. I, I just want to add that that um, knowing that community very, very clearly mm -hmm. and what you're talking about is very true. One of the things that I'm sure you already know, you said some of this was uh, information was worked out in the 90s. 96. Mm -hmm. This is a strong, powerful community. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that anything you do or make any changes in that community. And when you were talking about extension, I'm sure the community was involved in that at some point because they're very variable. And any signs or anything that you do, I'm sure that you're going to have to be involved in the community association because that's that Mount Washington community. Yes, ma'am. And uh, mm -hmm. they're very active, and I'm sure you already know how active they are over there. So yes. we have to be uh, involved and careful what we do to that school, what any changes that we make. Right, and this would not be con increasing the capacity whatsoever, which was, I think, their paramount concern. Um, but we were trying to um, relieve some of the, just that feeling of extreme tightness and the fact that their 3,100 square foot gym is often cut in half so that middle school children are playing in 1,500 square foot mm -hmm. spaces. They're, they have an inordinate amount of injuries on a daily basis just because of that, just running into walls. Yeah. And, well, I'm sure you did yeah. the right thing because I'm yeah. to, to extend, or make an extension in that community, in that building would take up a lot of space and I'm sure it would be uh, concern for the community if you did that. Right. It's very, it's actually pretty minimal and you're not going to really even see that from the front or even the sides of the school particularly. Um, and if you, if we had a, a more interesting site or a, an actual um, uh, Google image, you'd see that where that pushes out in the back, it, right now it's just kind of um, scrub undergrowth. It's not really a, um, a usable space where that pops out at the back. Right. And all we're doing is literally moving those three classrooms back right. so that we can extend the gym and make better circulation at the back. Right. Um, and then also access um, the, the elevator, which is, needs, oh, okay. is, uh, does not meet code any longer. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. You may have covered this, or I should know it, but you'll close the school, do the renovation, and then bring students back? Are you going to the plan is to swing them to um, yes. the Northwestern building. The, so Northwestern, okay. Thanks. We don't do any um, occupied renovations at all. No. Before you leave, I actually have a question. My mic wasn't working about the 21st century update. Do you mind if I go back with yeah. a question on there? Um, it, I think it is wonderful that we're celebrating the openings and that we need to be really, really conscientious of that. But can you just touch, were we on budget? Were we on time? If we weren't, what were the issues there? Um, do we have any, and, and if we don't have it readily at your fingertips, that's fine. Uh, do we have any statistics on the number of increased local hires we were able to do by lessening the, the restrictions on, on past nonviolent felonies. Um, I, I, when I, I was like, oh, 21st century update, I'm looking for like some meat. You wanted more of a, so um, there, there's a report that, that I do for a, a different venue that I would be more than happy to share with you that would give you those specifics. Okay. Um, we do track. Yeah. Yes, if you we, could, that would be great. Um, we track and I don't all want to diminish from the celebration and, and the beauty and joy of what nope. happened. But, and I know that the uh, I know that MSA would still at this point be um, 
gathering in all of the costing for that school because it's not all in for mm -hmm. those two schools that just opened. Usually it takes a while for, for all the costs to, to be accounted for um, in a school, especially one that's been where, right. where you have either a hugely extensive Correct. renovation or a replacement like we so did. So to that end, yeah. would have expected to see from the, the previous buildings that opened up. So just. Right. Okay. Yeah. No, I'd be you. happy to share that with you. Thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. There's actually a couple more slides. We'll just go through them really quick. But again, it's nothing. The only change that's happening, sorry, is right here. Um, if you go up to the second floor, again, you see we, there's nothing there. Um, these are existing, and this is just that expansion there. And then here's the proposed elevations. They're all the same except for the south elevation. Correct, and I think that's where the, um, where's the gym? In the back. This is the gym right here, yeah. And then those are the um, those three classrooms that we're putting back in. But that that's it. There's not again not much happening from the exterior for this project. And we can look at the main entrance. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, next will be the pyramid. Good morning. I'm just here to let you know we're way ahead of schedule. I just called Jeff Parker. He's on his way down. He should be down in a few moments. Thank you. Good morning. We're ready. You're ready. Good morning, members of the board. I'm Jeff Parker, Director of Procurement for the School System. Uh, we have a number of procurement items for your review this morning. Uh, the first contract is with Blackboard. Uh, this is a six-month extension of the existing agreement, uh, the purpose of which is to cover us, uh, cover services and support for our city schools website until uh, January 1st, at which time the new vendor will take over the contract. Uh, the next contract um, is for special education related services, specifically for our charter schools. Uh, this contract um, uh, should be in, as part of 
your role uh, would be going before the teaching and learning subcommittee of the board. Um, so what, what the school system did was we did a solicitation on behalf of the charter schools uh, so that they could uh, purchase related services should they desire. Uh, and so the estimated annual amount of the contract is $100,000. It's for uh, a five-year period, and it's available to them should they wish to avail themselves of those services. So this is for schools. So within their contract, charter schools have the authority, if they want to, they always have. Um, to They have always had in their contract the ability to apply for the right to provide services, the special ed services themselves, if they want to. Um, to date, only one school has ever asked for that authority, and it's Lily May Carol Jackson. So this um, procurement allows, pr provides vendors that are, would be purchased through our K-12 buy system that um, Lily May could choose from if other schools went through the process of getting approval to provide their own special ed services, they might avail themselves of this procurement as well. But so far, the only one who has, um, has asked for um, that authority and then had been approved for that authority is Lily May Carol Jackson. Um, I just want to mention that um, this comes out of the Teaching and Learning Committee, right? And, and we invited the Teaching and Learning Committee members to, to submit some questions, and that's not that they don't have any questions. They will probably ask some questions at the public meeting. Sure, that okay. makes sense. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. So my question related to this, um, it's, it's just something that we've mentioned in the past and looking for. Under the evidence of effectiveness, it's simply listed vendors selected have a proven track record of the delivery of high-quality services to children. Um, is there an addendum or amendment? Appendix, I mean. So. Hi, I'm Jim Patton. I'm the director of related services. Uh, I believe all of the vendors are, let me see the list. I believe they, they all have already had contracts with us and we've had successful experiences. So I know what, even way back when uh, Commissioner Hike Hubbard would ask um, to, see, to see what is that evidence. They, 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 we've used them on 60 occasions with 60 positive results and they move student achievement. Just looking for something more than a, a placating sort of statement of, yeah, we, we think they're effective, you should too, moving on. Okay, well, we certainly can, can add some additional wording. Speaking for related service in terms of compliance for notes and services being completed, we average at 98 to 99 percent and that includes our contractors. With these specific vendors? They are included in the pool okay. of the of Perfect. the. That would be great. And and again, I know that you have way more work on your plates than any one group of humans should have, um, but that little extra piece sure. just helps make sure that we're monitoring appropriately. I can absolutely add that. I have a question about this. So, the amount is a hundred thousand dollars, meaning that if there are five charters that wanted to avail themselves of these services equally, that's twenty thousand each, or is it up to hundred? No, sorry, to, to clarify, and I actually just came up and spoke in Jeff's ear, but he hasn't had a chance to say it. The $100,000 is approximate cost per FTE. We don't know how many charter schools are going to avail themselves of this. And so that's a, 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 an approximate per FTE cost. I'm, I don't understand that. What do you mean by it's a cost per FTE? Per person, per, per full-time person who would be uh, contracted through, through one of these six vendors, the approximate cost for a year would be about $100,000. But, but can I assume that when charter schools are, again, availing themselves of this, they're, they're paying for it from their own budget, correct? They're paying it for, uh, for it out of the allocation that they receive for special education from uh -huh. fair student funding. So the charter schools are right. almost entirely receive their um, special ed allocation in the same way that traditional schools do there's one difference that it's probably not worth talking about here but for the most part that it's the same That's and so they get an allocation for special ed based on the the census of the popular the specific needs of the students in their school right. and so using those resources then they can use those resources to um, to procure these services um, that's a fairly small school, so I, I guess I don't know the specifics, but I would guess they probably don't need a full FTE, um, Lily May. So they have they have been having conversations with the city neighbor schools, and their hope is that they will be able to share FTE. Right. 
I'm, yeah, but City Neighbors has to go through an application process to be approved to be able correct. to provide and the, services and there, they have not gone through that. There's a memorandum of understanding that's in draft. We'll spell out yeah. all the are details. Are we doing this for one or two, or it's open now to any charter that wants to uh, contract with one of these vendors directly? In the contract, in their in each of their contract, they are able to apply to us for the to gain the authority to provide the service themselves. Mm -hmm. Right now, the only one who has done that is Lily Mae Carroll. But if other ones were approved, then this procurement could be used. This this procurement is open to them to use. But what I don't understand, and I apologize, um, is this is an this is asking the board to approve a contract that does not exceed a hundred thousand dollars. So at when the it was it fair to say that when the when the hundred thousand dollars is spent either by one or two or four or five schools, we have depleted the authority that is being given to these schools. That is correct. So it's only a hundred thousand dollars. Correct. And why is it only I, I think perhaps the the letter needs to be modified and originally it was listed it was written just thinking of Lily Mae Carol Jackson and we've had a lot of meetings okay. and conversations that there may be more schools so we could we so we may have to amend it if there are more schools that are approved again at this time there's only one approved and I my I do not I can't imagine Lily Mae is going to use a full FTE is that accurate yes yeah so there will be some portion of this procurement they probably will not use. Other schools may be interested in it. We may have to come back with an addendum to, to add money to this procurement. It's possible. But again, this authority has been with charter schools since 2007 or something. And the only school has ever asked for in the past is um, Lily May. Now, there is one other school that's expressing some interest, but they have to. Yes. Uh, sorry. Let's we we'll come up to you got to come up. So I do think we're going to need to, to amend it. For the um, record, Angela, can you say who you are? Sure. Sorry. Um, Angela Alvarez, the executive director of the Office of New Initiatives. Um, so Lily May is the only school, that, as um, uh, Allison stated, that has board approval to do this. Um, but the city neighbors schools, which are three schools, have indicated interest in doing this. Um, and I know they're talking to other people, and, and I don't know the extent that we may get you know, a bunch more. Um, so I do think we need to be cognizant that we're likely to be coming back soon to. What is the timeline, though? Because my memory is in the contract they needed to apply by February 1 in order to have it for the, the following year. No, the con, uh, yeah, by February 1. Yeah, so yeah, they have to, yeah. So, this, so if they applied, this would be for the fall. this would be for the 1920 school year, not for 18-19. They've missed the deadline. They've missed the deadline, yep. That's right. So we we have, so we have some time. So I th think this is enough sufficient resources for Lily May, who has been approved yeah. for the eighteen nineteen school year. Other schools. So in the contract, it's always said that by February one, they would have to apply if they want to, to have this authority, and nobody else has. And although this dates back to two thousand seven, at that time we were under the Von G consent decree, and related services was a critical area of concern and monitoring. And this is. It just wouldn't not have been appropriate at that time. We were in the process of making up over 90,000 hours of supposedly missed services based on an audit by MSDE in 2004. We've been out of the consent decree since 2012, and we've maintained our compliance. So as a, as a department, as a, as a resource to the charter schools, we're ready for this opportunity. I have more questions, but not because I have any issues. I'm just, but I won't ask them now, and I imagine um, our other board members might as well it seems like an effective way to provide services to a charter who wants to try something different with approval from the district I might just provide the questions in writing later thanks thank you Thank you. The next, uh, the next contract item is to retain the services of John Walker as Chief Financial Officer for the school district for a period September 1, 2017 through June 30th, 2018, as, and the contract includes a one-year option for an additional year. The next contract Desilu Financial Consultants. I'm sorry. Uh, 
The next contract provided by the Chief Academic Officer is a requirements contract for file X document imaging services. Uh, the estimated total amount on the contract is $516,000 and it covers the period April 25, 2018 through April 24, 2021 with the two one-year renewals. Contract for the very capable um, John Walker. Just curious, Allison, is it unusual to have this position filled as a by a contractor? And what is the reason for a contractor versus a, a district employee? So it is un it is somewhat unusual to have an interim person um, fill the position. We have done it um, in the past. John Walker himself has has fulfilled it as a contractor in the past. Um, we are going to find it. We are look we will be looking for a permanent person to fill the position. That would be a permanent FTE. But he's um, ensured us that he will pr provide the service in order to provide some continuity and help us. One of the things is that we need to develop a um, kind of develop the bench of employees in, um, in finance who have the expertise. We've been without a budget director for a long time. We kind of don't have the some of the positions filled that we need to. So he's kind of helping us shore up the office and put it in place um, in a sound place before we pass it over to a permanent person. So he's willing to kind of work with us while we get past that period of time. Any further questions? The next contract, referring to the previ previous contract for scanning services, this is for scanning services of IEP records. So, Mr. Parker, I have a question on this one. Um, thank you, Megan. Predominantly, IEPs are done as an electronic document now, correct? And if so, why would we need 500,000 to scan documents? Uh, my name is Macon Tucker, manager of special education. Um, my name is Macon Tucker, manager of special education. Can you repeat your question? Sure. As, as I read this procurement item and I understand it to be um, the scanning of IEPs to share when students are transient or in and out of district, since the IEP process is electronic, then why would we need to have a $500,000 procurement to scan documents? These are for our documents that are um, for students who are graduated, um, but we have to keep those those records on file for seven years. So this would help us with that that cohort data for um, when schools close and we have inactive records. This is what this this document would be for. So is it about going back and uh, and electronicizing? There's not the right word for it. There is a right digitizing. digitizing. Digitizing prior records. Yes. So this is, this is about catching up from before, not about current practice. Both. In it's, keeping it's, records, it's both. It's current practice, um, and then ones that are from previous years as well. So, Mike, so I think the yeah. question is: currently, what are the documents that are that need to be scanned versus are already electronic? And so, as an addendum to that, why can't the ones that need to be scanned just simply go into the Xerox machine to be scanned? Right there. Why do we need an external contract for because this? Because then they can also destroy them after they've been scanned. So right now we have nowhere to store. Um, inactive records and things like that. So this actual company would scan them and then actually destroy them. So we wouldn't have to take care of that, that cost either. So, so is it fair to say that as you're transitioning into being completely digitized, that these are some of the existing IEP files, not all aspects of them are digitized at this point. So you're still in the process of transferring yes. over. Yes. So we, we procured, I believe it was within the last six months, a student data records management system. This, so I'm wondering what additional service this offers. That but so an IEP has records in it that go over a long period of time. Right. And so as you have an IEP meeting, you still, you have to take all those older records, you know, whether they're, you know, a, you know, a cognitive tests or psychological evaluations, Absolutely. whatever they are, are part of that. And they may be from outside folks. So as I assume, as those meetings happen, then you are using this service to then digitize each of those records and then get them up to date. And what I'm wondering is, as we go meeting by meeting, isn't it more cost effective for the IEP compliance monitor to just simply walk over to the Xerox, zoot, 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 and then in-house within our student data management system that saves student records for traditional students mm -hmm. for seven years after they graduate and then automatically destroys them, that this couldn't be part of that? But I think what's missing here, well, what's missing is the aspect of the closing schools now 
and where are we to store the records that are coming in now? In the schools that are being closed. Um, so this is the schools that are being closed as part. So large number, when you're close, when we, we have a large number of schools that we're closing over the past several years. So when we're closing those schools, all their records have to be digitized um, going back for however many years. And so it's not like on a case by case in the IEP meetings. Right. It's like the whole, it's the whole group of them. Okay. So do we anticipate not needing this con type of a contract in three years because we will have everything digitized and can in real time do it efficiently ourselves? I would foresee that within the next three years, depending on how many more schools we close, but we should, after this um, contract is up, we should not have to do a renewal for this. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. The next contract is a request to the board to increase the existing contract with Kendall Hunt Publishing Company by $250,000 so we can purchase the M2 and M3 curr curriculum. Again, this would be an item before teaching and learning. My question is when you request of the board an increase in a contract, um, you, the, where, where, you, you typically also ask or you present where the money's coming from and whether or not this is an increase um, on an unanticipated cost Correct. or an increase beyond the mm -hmm. original con contract and as I said, where is the source? So the source of funding for this is Title I? But and it's Title I, but is it Title I that was budgeted? When, when I, I, mm. <laughs> I get confused when the, it's a contract increase. So to me, the, the narrative is we had a contract, we ran out of uh, authority to pay from that contract because we spent the money and we're now seeking additional money that was not, that and then, the, if we are seeking additional money, where where is that in the budget? Is it is there a, so, something called a contingency line item? Is there something that was unspent or no, no longer needed? But we've asked that when there is an increase to a contract, that there is a clear explanation of where the money is coming from, if it was unanticipated or something else. So, in in those instances, the each school is allocated uh, a certain amount of Title One dollars. And so this, at the direction of teaching and learning, the school adjusts their Title I expenditure from Contract A to Kendall Hunt Publishing in this instance. Mm -hmm. And so they would create requisitions and encumbrances against their budgets using those Title I dollars in lieu of other Title I dollars. So we've increased our gifted and talented placements and set settings around the city. Is that what this is reflective of? Um, hi, I'm Dennis Jutras, uh, coordinator of Gift and Advanced Learning. There are two components there. Yes, we've ex when we originally wrote the contract in 2016, we had 27 sites that would have affected. Now we're up almost 60 sites that will be affected. Also, the district in compliance with what ESSA is expecting is it reallocated Title I dollars usually used by the district office and has been very proactive in making it available for procurement of gifted resources. And so that's really where the big chunk of the additional request is coming from is district provided Title I funds to be purchased for gifted resources. What's Title I funds? Is that Title I is, is the allocation for? They're federal dollars for high poverty schools. High poverty. That's yeah. the main source of federal funds that, and so schools that are eligible receive a Title I allocation based on their poverty, however it's certified, and then they have the ability to reallocate within the budgets that were approved by the district. Do they, when they get approval for their Budgets, do they have to show an allocation of all the spending for the Title I dollars they receive? Typically, they do not. They, so they, they, would, they would identify it as curriculum and associated materials. 
mm. something like such as but that. this is a combination the schools are using some of their resources are coming from schools and some of it's being spent through the district um, title one allocation so the district holds some money centrally and this is part of the some of the district spending in fact the lion's share of this ask is coming from the central office procurement mm -hmm. the use of the title one funds to help jumpstart the gifted programming at more and more sites that are identified as title one sites so if that's the case and I think my question is I think more pertinent in the sense that there was an allocation that is that may be no longer no longer is needed for Title I funds, which allows you to reallocate an increase for this contract. So there may have been so I can't. Uh, we can have Title I um, give us some information to help us update this before it goes to the public board. But if there's underspending in some areas, then we'll use it for other areas. So we can help identify for you what those underspendings are. I there. I mean, I can think of some areas that I don't know if this is where this was funded yeah. or not, but like I know in the some of the blueprint, um, some of the staffing we um, planned to hire in the blueprint, we didn't hire them quite as early as we thought for the coaches. It took us a little longer to hire some of the coaches. Right. So that freed up some salary money in Title I, so I don't know if that's one of the, the sources. That, in fact, is one of the allocations mm -hmm. that's so been readjusted. In, in yeah. general, that's exactly what we've asked for, an okay. explanation yeah. of when you're asking to increase a contract amount. Where is it coming from? Where is it yeah. coming from? What yeah. is no longer going to be purchased for yes. the reasons you just um, okay. explained? So we can try to, um, we will make sure that that's more clear in the next uh, solicitation for the, I mean, in the next procurement letter that goes to the board at the full board meeting. Great, thanks. Thank you. The next procurement item is is a request to increase the existing contract to purchase foods, frozen refrigerated, uh, delivery services, commodities, dry canned goods, et cetera, by $2.5 million. Um, the primary reason why this request is necessary is, is that prior to this, City Schools purchased uh, all of their commodities directly from the vendors listed uh, in the middle of the document. Uh, food and Nutrition has transitioned that purchase from those vendors to U.S. Foods for efficiency purposes, delif del delivery logistics, et cetera. So, so we're essentially moving the procurements of USD commodities from the vendors listed below to U.S. Foods. The next contract is, is also a request for an increase in the amount of $210,000 to purchase bread products. The increase is necessary due to increased demand uh, as a result of the adult care food program. Have a question or reference to it? No, yeah. I asked it. Thanks. You, okay. I'll include an explanation in there about the how food nutrition operates as an enterprise fund. So, with the additional meals served, they receive additional revenue. It is in the description here. It talks about that the increased revenues that we have generated due to increased participation. Could you get those answers? Did you need answers before the board meets? That is the answer to that question, right? Yep. Yeah. Okay, that's enough. Okay, thank you. Uh, and lastly, um, another increase uh, based on increased consumption as well for the district's uh, increase in the purchase of fruits and vegetables. Um, the request of the board is to increase the contract by one and a half million dollars. Um, this would cover purchases between now and September 30th, 2018, at which time we'll come back to the board for a new contract and their approval. Next is a contract with Amazon Business. Um, the estimated annual amount is $50,000. Uh, 
the city schools is riding a contract that was awarded by Prince William County Public Schools via U.S. Communities to Amazon. Uh, Amazon has uh, established uh, what they call Amazon Business, uh, which is a website arrangement via which schools can purchase things for their uh, school. Just, I do have a question. Under MBEWB, it's NA. So I think for the public, can you explain why purchases through Amazon or whatever website they might have would not have some MBEWB requirements along with it? Sure. So the, the MBE requirements are dri driven by the schools district that actually issues the solicitation. So in this case, Prince William County is the school district that issued the solicitation, so they look to their rules in terms of MBE requirements. Uh, to the contrary, if, if Baltimore City Public Schools was to issue a solicitation, we would look to our rules and, and apply them accordingly. So it's, it's based on the fact that Prince William County did not have any MBE uh, guidelines for this procurement that uh, the, the contract was awarded. I mean, I think it's important for the board to know what other things uh, could be purchased um, from other than actually purchasing office supplies from Amazon. So the purpose of the MBE program is really to segment, segment out um, purchases that are beyond just what the prime award of the contract is for. So if you look at construction, when we're building a school, you can easily identify other components of work associated with building a school that can be segmented out to other vendors. But if we were just purchasing coffee and that was the product, it would be hard to segment out something else from the actual purchase of coffee to another vendor. Yeah, I, th I think, you know, it's, it's an interesting question, the, the benefits of piggybacking on other jurisdictions. I'm certain it wasn't done to avoid MBEWB, right. but the question is if we had done this solicitation directly, mm -hmm. would there be MBEWB requirements on the contract? Probably maybe 2%. Okay. That's what our current office supply agreement has. The next contract is with AT&T to provide cellular services for the district. Uh, this contract was, we're also piggybacking a contract and solicitation that was issued by Fairfax County Public Schools. Uh, the contract term is July 1, 2018 through June 30th, 2021. Uh, this contract also qualifies for E-rate reimbursement. Any no questions? questions no. Right. Thank you. Uh, the next contract is with Viola Baltimore Energy Company. Uh, the contract has three components. Uh, the first is to provide steam, ongoing steam services to Dunbar High School, NAF, formerly Dunbar Middle, and NAF Thomas G. Hayes Elementary. The contract also provides for monitoring services of 21st century schools currently, as well as additional schools as they come online. And thirdly, the contract provides for the district mechanics and laborers should they become necessary at specified hourly rates. Just out of curiosity, um, within the, the current monthly rate commodity charge, um, went down 40 cents or roughly 40 cents a month simply because or 40 cents a unit um why just so steam is cheap now <laughs> people are cold they felt bad for us <laughs> well actually it, it's it's due in part to the additional services that we are provide that viola is going to provide to us so as part of the negotiation 
to procure those services. They agreed to lower commodity charges. Uh, they also agreed to, uh, there was a fourth school that was receiving steam from Viola. Uh, that school now has their own uh, energy plant. So we had to, we requested and terminated that agreement. That agreement came with it fixed costs for the remainder of the contract term, which would have been another two years approximately. And so as part of this negotiation, they agreed to waive those fixed charges. Thank you. The next contract is <clears throat> with Hertrich Fleet Services to purchase vehicles for maintenance and operations. We're talking about five vehicles as outlined on the page. The next contract, the next contract is to secure grass mowing services uh, for the next three year term, plus two one year renewal options. Uh, the estimated annual amount is $575,000 to cut the grass. Yeah, I have a question about this and in general. There was an article in the paper this morning about how African Americans in Baltimore make roughly half of what whites make in Baltimore and it just struck me that every contract that we've reviewed and approved either has a waiver from MBEWBE or it says it's not applicable which I, I understand how the program works but when we get to grass cutting uh, which seems like a service that could uh, and probably is provided by MBE companies or WB companies why are we receiving a, a waiver for that and in, more, in, in general, uh, if you could just speak to this at the end, um, because it's a fair question for the public to ask, why, has, why is there not a single contract that we're proving today that has any MBEWB? There may be one. I might have missed it and we haven't finished. But the point is most of them don't have participation goals for MW or M or WBE. But if you could just speak to this one in particular, um, why this would be waived. So the process for uh, obtaining a waiver or not obtaining a waiver, but the process we go through in procurement is that when we, before we issue a solicitation, we send the solicitation down to the MBE office. And they go through a matrix in terms of what work can be segmented out from the initial work of the contract. So in this case, if it's cutting grass, what other work can be, what other things can be bought beyond just the actual services of hiring someone to cut the grass? So it could be purchasing gasoline. It could be office supplies. It could be temporary help in their office or something like that. So when we send the procurement down the MBE office, they look at these types of opportunities and then they make a decision. And so the decision we get back from the MBE offices is that, you know, given the size of this contract, $575,000, and then divide it by three, because there are three vendors on it, so it's two hundred or $160,000 or something, how much of that could actually be segmented out to someone else? And so the, they make the determination for us, and then we, we proceed based on their determination. Well, maybe we should ask them because there's no segmentation here. And you, you've, you've talked about opportunities for segmentation. And the other, of course, sort of debate is whether primes should get the benefit of an MBE um, designation as well. So I don't know if any of these three contractors are MBE. And if they are, they probably wouldn't count under the program, which is really for subs. But Correct. if they are MBE primes, I think that should be noted. Are any of them MBE primes? They're the P2 cleaning is a WBE. Mm -hmm. And I would like to know why none of this can be segmented to other potential vendors down the line. We all, may I answer, Joe? Sure. It also includes, well, it also allows minority businesses that may not have the proper accreditation as an MBE firm to bid. I believe there was discussion several years ago on their different board members that when we did have the minority participation, they asked that we could probably reconsider and look at allowing more minority firms to bid on this contract 
as a prime versus just being a subcontractor. Now, if you do get a minority business, the contractual price is going to go higher understand because they have to rely on a subcontractor with their prices and they may push them out but also they're relying on somebody to provide services that they're under their ownership of their actual contract which is difficult to at times to oversee for this type of work so there's two things one we give the opportunity for more minorities to bid as a prime possibly to be awarded and then also the ownership of the actual contract. Well, a minority prime can bid without our approval. Correct. Right? Unless there's uh -huh. some pre-qualification. I don't know if that works. But right. anyway, my question specifically here is why this can't be segmented and then more generally why are we receiving why have none of these contracts have any of those requirements? But you don't need to answer that now. Yeah, I have a question. I'm a little bit familiar and I'm, I'm learning a lot about minority contractors to be quite frank with you. My daughter was the one that got the bill through years ago, the percentage in court. So I'm a little bit familiar on that part. But I think that at some point, just listening to um, the commissioner here talk about it, we should investigate a little bit more and find out why minority contractors are not getting as much as possible. I think that's important, considering the fact that we're the, the system, we're in a minority environment, you know, and we're putting out a lot, a lot of finance. So we need to be really clear about if there is a process or is there a reason why minority contractors aren't getting their fair share, or maybe, maybe they are getting their fair share. But I think that um, we, if we could find, and I know it takes a lot of work, and we're asking a whole lot, but I think that we need to investigate and find out the whole process of what's going on. And I, I would, re I'm sure board members would be interested in that, because I do. It would be it helpful to have the MBE uh, office come present to an operations committee meeting to talk about what the um, process is, what they go can through. The, can we have the MBE? Yeah, I think that that would be a not great only idea. have exactly. We might want to even have the person that got the bill through, and work with them and give us some good explanations of why, because we hear too many things at at some point that that they, they might not be getting their fair share, and we don't know if that's true or not. But it's, it's always okay. good to know, you know, because we don't want to assume anything. Okay? Yes. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah, ask a question. Uh, so to that end, thank you. Um, included in last week's board updates were the prior MBE and, and WBE. I said in, the, in this week's board updates? Were in response to a question I asked last week, was the last MBE, WBE overall presentation for where we are in the district, percentage of contracts awarded. Um, so that's in, in, in our email. So thank you for sharing that one last week. Um, my question is channeling Commissioner Kashani, uh, and who long time has asked, when we release these RFPs, what are we getting back as far as academic or student support from awarding a contract? And while lots of the contracts I could see spaces, in this, you know, in the, in the landscape gardening services, do we have yet a process in procurement in the rubric where companies can earn additional points if they say they'll take a youth worker in the summer or, or sponsor, you know, three interns um, or do a push-in unit with a school or provide academic, you know, if it's, if it's the um, contact that's supporting us having an interim C CFO, are they willing to help with financial literacy kind of classes in schools or curriculum. Um, do we have that yet? If we don't, do we have a timeline for moving to adding that? We do, we do not currently have that in the rubric. Um, our, our rubrics are very much structured in terms of if it's a bid, it's low price, assuming all other things are equal. Um, so we would, we would need to consult with staff and see how best to address that because you could end up in a situation where well they offered one individual and this person offered two individuals uh, to mentor uh, but this price is lower but this price is higher and which price would we take uh, it, it's those types of balances that we would have to assess and, and respond to the board well admittedly it would be a huge challenge 
Um, yes. But we are offering hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars, and in many cases, millions of dollars to companies, and our primary job is still instructing students. Correct. So um, um, I will circle back up with the chair um, and see if that is still still a driving force for her. Um, and if so, I'd like to propose that we ask that that happen. Okay. Um, I'd like to make a comment. Not only do, should we propose that that should happen, but this is an identical question, identical question that was asked by Kashani, like you again, just said. Again, again, again. And we keep asking the question. And one of the things that I'm greatly concerned with is that, um, and not trying to put extra work on anyone, but when we ask these questions, could we just have a note or something so that we can see that something was done in, and the questions won't continue to be asked if you could get it. When you do what you're going to do to get that answer, mm -hmm. could you send a note and we can collect that information and share with the board members so we know that we're not spending a whole lot of time asking questions over because we spent, what, two minutes to ask the question again? And how many minutes have we spent before, previous to ask the same question again? Okay, thank you very much. We can do okay. that. Yes. Sure. We're going to move uh, along kind of as quickly because. Um, we have a number of other um, procurements that we need to talk about, and we're kind of getting, running out of time. Okay, thank you. So, um, briefly, the next contract is to replace the HVAC system at Mergenthaler Vocational Technical School. The contract amount is two million six hundred sixty-one thousand three hundred ninety-six dollars. Uh, the contract does have MBE participation of twenty-six percent for the board's uh, consideration. The next contract is to provide swimming pool repair and maintenance services. Uh, city schools received one bid in response to the solicitation. The estimated contract amount is $900,000. Essentially, we're, they're providing labor services to maintain the pools for us. I did have a question in reference to that. Uh, this 900, you can just help me here. The, how many pools are you talking about? Talks approximately 11 pools, oh, the therapeutic yeah. and the high school pools. We have them at William Bear, Robert Coleman, I'm not Robert Coleman, I'm sorry, George McMeekin, Mervo, Digital Harbor, all the high schools, Poly Western. I think this is fantastic. This is the whole child. This is experiences outside of the classroom. And I think it's something that the district should really promote, that we are making investments in non-academic. Non I know that's where the focus is. But this is really great for our students to have these swimming opportunities. Next contract is to renovate the media center at uh, James McHenry Elementary Middle School. The total amount of the contract is $1,158,000. Mr. Parker, can you just tell us quickly why, why and how um, McHenry were selected since they just had a pretty significant renovation in other areas of the school? So we go through a process um, with, and this is based off of the uh, qualified school zone um, uh, academy bond. And so there's a, a layer of different processes that we review it. We reveal it, review it from um, our academic team provides input into it, um, facilities, and particularly facilities conditions to make sure that the media center is going into a space that can be supported. Um, we also look at it, um, MSDE has um, a list of schools that they, are, they target in terms of from an academic perspective. Um, and then the last overlay is that the Weinberg Foundation provides a contribution, so then they also provide some um, input. And so James McCarran was one of those sites that it had additional other supports. Um, one of the things that's happening is that the QZAP funds are have, well, now the program no longer exists, um, wasn't funded in the last governor's budget. But previously, the QZAP dollars had been shrinking. And so we needed additional support outside of just city school support and wine bar support. And the James McKinney community actually brought additional funds to the table. Uh, the next contract is to provide repair and installation services to the school's auditorium seats and bleachers. Uh, this is a request of the board to extend the existing contract by one year. Which is also the same for the following contract with commercial cabling and light to provide 
lighting and electrical services to the district. This is a request of the board to extend that contract for one additional year. And the next contract is to replace the windows at Francis Scott Key Elementary Middle School. The total amount of the contract is $742,400. Again, the MBE participation is 28%. The next contract is to replace the windows at Locker, Lockerman Bundy Elementary Middle. The total cost of the contract is $594,800. Uh, here the MBE participation is 23%. And the contract, next contract is a contract with Scribbles Software in the amount of $427,800. Uh, this is to con is to convert uh, student records. So my question related to this is the same question I asked before. Um, with the special ed procurement request for 500,000, now we're up to almost a million on data student records. Um, maybe naive if we think about doing this as one rather than two or pieces of that. Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Heather Nolan. I'm the Director of Knowledge Management in the Office of Achievement and Accountability. Hi, ben, oh, hi, Ben Goldberg. I'm the Manager of Data Quality. I work with our Student Records Office. So your question was, again, the, like, the one contract for digitization of records versus our approach with two separate contracts. Okay, great. Um, so with the contract that we're proposing right now with the Scribble software, um, this is for permanent records. So the student cumulative record as we shared in the uh, JRA policy that was approved by the board, um, we have a requirement through MSTE to maintain permanently certain components of a student's record. That's the personal information as well as the transcript. Um, and we also have a uh, number of records in our, our in our office of student records that is in via uh, via microfilm. So this contract covers the digitization of what we're required to keep permanently, as well as the transfer of the microfilm, which is deteriorating into a more digital platform. Uh, you are correct, uh, Commissioner, that the student information system does maintain uh, certain components of the record more permanently, but this is more addressing the backlog that we have in the school district going as far back as 1924 that we're still required to maintain permanently permanently. The difference between this contract and that of the special education uh, department around their digitization is, as mentioned earlier, is their dig digitization is our understanding that it's only for records that need to be maintained seven years. And the solution that they're trying to also solve for is an issue around space and where to maintain it. And so that's why they went through this their particular company to, to manage that, whereas, whereas our contract is to manage those that are permanent um, and is a backlog for our district, as well as the, the contractor that we selected. Um, they also manage our online transcript request process, and so we have the capability now by expanding these services to be able to transmit our, uh, the, the transcripts that are often requested um, on a daily basis uh, by customers uh, online through a secure platform that helps eliminate, uh, you know, undo uh, inefficiencies in our district. So I appreciate that, and I, I appreciate and understand the rationale from both groups. I'm thinking about a student transferring. I'm, I'm a transient kid, I'm going to go to school A this month and then for some reason or another three weeks later I'm somewhere else and mm -hmm. eight weeks later I'm somewhere mm -hmm. else. Having my IEP on a different platform than my permanent record mm -hmm. seems like that might be problematic in getting the best servicing to me possible sure. when I move. So this, these are both, well I can't speak to the, the special education one, but the, the records that we, what we are handling through this contract is the inactive records. So these okay. are students that are no longer Perfect. with our school district. Good, mm -hmm. done. Okay. 
before you break. <laughs> exactly. Great. It just it, it just seemed like, and again, right. if they're active records, and then when right. we go to the next, you know, we're no. not on microfiche anymore. We don't know what the next one is to imagine. Now we've got to convert Makes two sense. formats. And so yes, yep. definitely. And we have Good. just as a side note, we have a process by which um, through the records manual that MSD shares with us, we have a process by which. A IEP records as well as student cumulative records needs to be transferred within a particular period of time for our active students. Correct. All right. Before, thank you so much. Thank mm -hmm. you. If before, that was really clear at the top. I perfect. Thanks. <laughs> before you move, what is your name? Heather Nolan. Oh, I, that explanation is excellent. Great. And you know what? Attached to, I know this is extra work and probably say here she goes again, but if you attach that information to the document. And it might have been. It will eliminate a whole lot of questions okay. because you gave an outstanding explanation. Oh, thank you. Thank okay. you so much. Great. And Ben, you are right. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> We're a team here. Thank you. Okay. okay. Thanks. And the last contract is with is with James Watt, Wattam to provide legal services to the district. It's an increase of $5,000. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And um, thank you. And that's the end of our uh, op operations committee. And our uh, next meeting will be uh, May 15th, 2018. And um, I want to thank everybody for being here, even though it's not that many people. But thank you in the community. And um, see you soon. Thank you. 11.23 a.m. <laughs>